Hello and welcome to our virtual Lunch and Learn. Today we're talking about Drive's installation best practices. This is part two of a two-part series that we started last week. So if you missed part one, you can watch it anytime on the McNaughton McKay YouTube channel under the virtual Lunch and Learn playlist. My name is Rachel Green. I'm the digital communication specialist here at McNaughton McKay Electric Company. Our series is led by Les Smith, systems consultant out of our Toledo, Ohio branch. And out in the comment section, ready to answer your questions is Lee Smith, Drive's product manager out of our Charlotte, North Carolina location. We'll also have a Q&A portion at the end for Les to answer your questions in more depth. We'll be getting started shortly. As you come in, let us know where you're joining us from in the comment section. We've shared a link to a short quiz in the comments that Les will be referring to later in his presentation. Feel free to download, print, or have the quiz on your device for easy reference as we go through the presentation. For anyone just joining, welcome to our virtual Lunch and Learn, Drive's Installation Best Practices, Part 2. Part one is available on our channel under the Virtual Lunch and Learn playlist. Let us know where you're joining us from in the comment section as you come in. In the second part, systems consultant Les Smith will continue his discussion of important developments in drive installation practices and what you need to know as an installer. Welcome Lee and Leanne, thanks for joining us. Our specialist, Lee, is ready to respond to your questions in the comments section as we go along. We'll also have a Q&A segment at the end of Les's presentation to address some of those questions. If you'd like to reach out afterwards or if you have further questions for Les, you can always send us an email at macamaclive at macamac.com. Be sure to let us know which session you attended and we'll direct your questions to Les directly. We'll have that email address on the screen for you at the end as well. Looks like we have a number of attendees now, so let's get started. Les, I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, welcome back. This is uh, part two of Drive Installation and would encourage you, if you didn't see part one, to uh, look at that at your leisure. Uh, there will be a quiz at the end or just questions, we'll call it, and I'll self-answer those. But if you want to download the quizzes, uh, and send them back to Mac and Mac will get you a uh, certificate uh, that says you watch both these sessions and you answer the questions. Um, as we go on, uh, just going to the next page, uh, this uh, has to do with the drive panel. This presentation, the previous presentation was on the drive input and we're halfway through the drive panel and going on and then we'll go to the drive uh, output. And we'll answer questions or we'll cover that installation. Uh, take a look at the bottom there. Uh, you'll see that there are seven different uh, pub numbers. And then you'll see at the top where it says drive panel and that small square symbol that relates to drives dash AT003 publication. That's where I would have got this information. I'd encourage you to uh, download these. Uh, articles, put them in your library, and if you're a drive installer, use them for your reference. Um, also, uh, as I go out in the field, uh, a lot of times uh, I'll, I'll see customers and, and their, their picture of their installation is usually Star Wars, something great and grand. But one thing that I, I see when I walk on, instead of Star Wars, I see Groundhog Day. I see uh, continuously uh, the same thing time and time again. So that's why we did this to begin with. There was just a lot of questions to be answered on drive installations. So I'd encourage you to take this and uh, look at it uh, at your leisure, uh, reread it uh, to uh, just beef up your knowledge on drives. All right, we're looking at this slide here and this this is uh, from the, uh, the Oracle slide, and they're trying to tell you this. Um, if you're going to go to PE, go directly to PE uh, from the, from the uh, transformer to the PE on the drive, uh, or from the drive PE to the ground on the motor. No jumpers. And what they're trying to show you here is they had some PE terminals out there on the, on the control panel, and they jumpered to that 
and then that jumpered to the drive. And they would just assume you go direct, no jumpers on this. Okay, this has to do with in the drive panel. Take a look at the picture on your on your left here. And let me change my pointer to a laser so you can see it easier. Uh, this is a 750 drive, and uh, I'll cover 750 and, seven, and uh, 520 drives. But you can see we need this clearance here of uh, three inches before and aft. This is to get rid of the heat. This should always be in there, but be aware of the temperature of the drive that it needs in its various environments. And that's covered in this table over here that I, I won't read to you. The one interesting thing here is this drive, the PowerFlex 750 drives, um, needs to be mounted on a flat surface. No standoffs, no unistruts. Take a look right here. Do not use standoffs or spacers. In addition to input air, must be exceeded uh, for product special specifications. Uh, if you take a PowerFlex 70, for instance, out of an uh, MCC, it's mounted on a, a cross bracket here and a cross bracket here. If you was to put a 750 and to meet this expectation, you'd have to put a back plate or a plate that you would get full surface mounting here. The reason for this is that uh, they need to have a solid support to this drive from top to bottom, which includes the inductor inside. I had a situation where I had poor power quality and the drive started to sound like a buzzer. Uh, and that was because we were mounted on unistruts. We put a solid backplate on there and the noise went away. Here we look at the 520s. Uh, and this is an environment, this is also the uh, spacing here of two inches here and two inches here. Uh, be aware of that. Uh, just because the duct has uh, holes in it and wire doesn't necessarily mean that the air will flow through. If anything, put a standoff on these drives and mount them above the ductwork so you get good flow. Uh, you will extend the life of the drives when you do this. If you have too much heat in here, it will dry out the capacitors in the drive and they will uh, fail prematurely. Again, on the environment here, uh, symptoms of drive failure are nuisance faults. Uh, the word Rojas, R-O-H-S, uh, they've changed the material in drives. They've taken heavy materials out. Um, they, uh, when they took the heavy metal out, uh, there's not as, um, it doesn't um, ex stay in the environment as hearty. It's not as hearty, let's just say that on that. And plus we have smaller, we have smaller circuits now these day, and we have, but we do have conformal coating. But the fact is these drives, uh, won't stand up as well as the older drives. And that's not just one brand, that's all brands. The circuitry has got much finer. So be aware of that and keeping them cool, keeping them away from contaminants. And here we go back to uh, this, this statement here, uh, atmosphere, uh, protect the cooling fans, so I do not expose to corrosive. This, has, this statement came out of a 520. And this statement came out of competitors' drive. They make the same statements. Keep the drive's environment friendly to the drive. Now we're moving into grounding, uh, which uh, I come across an awful lot. Grounding practices, and then I put parentheses, high frequency. Uh, it's not 60 hertz. Uh, this is kilohertz. Uh, the symptoms, you're going to get ground faults communication faults um, because of the high frequency that the drive uh, puts out to the motor here. Uh, motor shield, and as this is stated here, uh, ground directly back to the drive, from the drive to the panel board. Motor cable shield directly back to the PE, then from the, then from the drive panel ground. This is um, no breaks in the ground. 
And don't let the ground touch the metal either. Uh, that would uh, cause ground loops also. Uh, I came across this uh, against one of uh, with our vendors. This is a Faraday shield uh, from Panduit, and it can be mounted in here. They give an example. This is the clearance range needed for noise. If you don't have a Faraday shield or a shielding of any type, this is what's needed if we do have shielding. And just proportionately, you can see that you've got to keep it greater distance if you don't have uh, a shield in there. And also right here, uh, they also make duct that is um, coated with an aluminum foil on the side, around the bottom, and up, which helps also on that. So you can use the Faraday shield or you can use shielded duct to help you out in very sensitive uh, situations. Okay, we're going into the outputs here. Um, this, as we see, is in the drive, uh, uh, drives IN001, it's grounding and installation guidelines. And this has to do with the output of the drive. We saw last week that they had a, a similar cable or a cable relative to the input and the impedance of the power source. This has to do with the uh, motor uh, and its um, insulation phase to phase. Take a look here. Older motors may have 1,000 volts phase to phase, 1,200 volts. Uh, inverter motors today will be 1,400 volts to 1,600 volt insulation. And what they're showing you here is a 753 drive or 750, uh, a one and two horsepower here. And this is the distance you can go from the motor to the drive uh, without having uh, any incidents or problems here. And then uh, if you want to go farther, we can put a reactor between the drive and the motor called a, a load reactor. And, and you can see right here, uh, let's go 1400 volt. I can go 500 feet if I put a reactor on the output of the drive, uh, whereas here I can only go 275. Another note here, uh, and you, you have other um, devices here. This is a reflective wave reduction device, which is just a reactor with parallel um, resistors. Over here, you're going to have RC circuits. We call them terminators. Those can be used also. We have various devices that can be used on motor cabling uh, uh, installations. Take a look here. Uh, you'll see in some of these, as we go up in horsepower, uh, we go longer distances. And the reason for this is switching time. And we'll talk about that a little later on. Um, the bigger the drive, the slower the switching time on the transistors. The drive load, the lighter the load, the faster the switching also. So we can say that the worst thing we could have would be a small drive, lightly loaded, which would have the fastest switching time. And also here, uh, the PWM frequency, this is telling me parameter 440 in uh, 520 and uh, uh, parameter 38 in 750, uh, set them to their lowest value if you want less a chance of having problems. It will cut your, your problem uh, response in, in half as far as uh, switching time. Uh, normally you'll go from four kilohertz down to two. Here's a reflective wave out of the VFD. You can see here, this is uh, at the drive, and you can see here, this is at the motor. We're gonna double our voltage here. On a 460 volt, you're gonna have roughly 750 volts on, uh, on this peak here, and you're gonna have up to 1200 when it gets out to the motor. It's gonna grow, it's called the reflective wave. All the energy won't go into the motor and it will reflect back to the drive. And as we saw in the insulation, some of the insulations were 1,200 and 1,000, which could be damaging for the first windings in the motor. Reflective wave solutions. Uh, mitigation techniques, inverter, uh, duty motor, and you'll see on the motor some indication of inverter duty. Uh, and also, as far as noise go, a common mode choke, 
is what we would use right on the output of the drive. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a, a higher amperage than the smallest. The smallest is a nine amp. We had that in previous slides. This is probably 49 amp in there. Notice the 120 degrees uh, on your uh, common mode chokes. This is the best um, for reduction of noise. So we'd have them 120 degrees apart. Uh, over here, this is also, we can put an output line reactor here, or we can put an RWR, which is gonna have the resistors in parallel uh, with uh, the reactor. Uh, if you take a look at uh, some Alan Bradley literature on that, they'll even tell you the value to make your own on that. Uh, and then the terminator, which is going to go uh, within 20 feet of the motor, not farther than that, or the standing wave will grow again. So that's an RC circuit that you can put out there. Limit the motor lead length, and I could not understand why they would put that in, since most of us are in industry and we have a set length. But when I came across test stands, I saw that they had a wire hook and they looped the wire around the test machine out uh, back to the drive. So I'm going to assume that's what that means there. If you have loops of wire, take them out to lessen the chance of noise. And again, a lower the PWM frequency, as previously stated. Um, and look for recommendations from the vendor. They'll actually give you some motor links, uh, lead links here on these nameplates. And then use grounded, shielded drive wire. Okay, output wire cable. Uh, we're going to see here, uh, we'll just read this here, insulation thickness and connectivity. Um, and this is in drives IN001. Wire must have insulation thickness um, greater than 15 mils. And the wire insulation must not have significant variations and, and concentricity, meaning it should be centered over here. Shouldn't be any bends, shouldn't be any scratches. And then I had this one in here. As of 217, in NFPA 79, it came out with this statement here for servos and for drives. And it says, this is the wire that can be used, marked RHH, RHW, RHW2, XHHW, and et cetera. It left out THHN. THHN is not according to NFPA 79 since 2017 because the it just met the spec the thickness of it here and if there was a scratch it was below spec if there was a bend it was below spec if there was a 90 degree hang on the wire at the 90 degrees this insulation would stretch and become thinner so uh thhn not per nfpa 79 anymore um down here, this is this spec came out in 217, uh, and it was asked uh, a customer needed this for branch circuit protection, uh, and it is uh, take a look at that, read it yourself. 430.122, a 125 percent rated input current is, uh, and uh, that's your wire size. Drives are dual rated now, so you can have a 75. A horsepower drive, or you can have a 66 horsepower drive out of the same drive, depending if it's heavy duty or normal duty. Um, I would read that on your own and just be up to up to date on that particular spec as far as minimum wire. The shielded cable. Um, this isn't necessarily for shielded cable, but here here we see the ground wire going back with phase A, B, and C, or one, two, and three. Um, this we're going to get more ground currents on this because it's not equally spaced out here. Whereas if we take a look at this armored cable, just as an example, we see the ground wire goes from here to here, or there's three leads and they're 120 degrees. That means that there will be cancellation in the ground currents and there'll be less ground currents coming back on that. However, this only refers to the statement of 60 hertz. Uh, as you know, in the drive, we can run various different frequencies, et cetera. However, this layout here will lessen the coupling of the noise 
uh, that is going back on the, on the drive wire. Uh, this has to do with routing. Uh, keep all your low voltage over to one side of the panel and your high voltage or, or high power on the other side. If your conduits come in, your ground currents will travel on this side of the panel. Uh, you don't want the ground currents traveling over here. If you don't have proper grounding, the grounding, uh, the back plate will pick up the ground, it's liable to go into the PLC and uh, sensitive instruments. Cable charging currents. Uh, this is an example of cable charging currents. We'll talk a little bit more, but at uh, three meter, this is our cable charging currents. And this is the charge uh, uh, energy required every cycle that we need to charge uh, the cable capacitively. Um, whereas over here is 30 meters. And you see the longer the wire, the more the capacitance, the more the current. Cable charging currents here. Um, we're going to have overcurrent fault, uh, hardware overcurrent, sorry, hardware overcurrent, which is different than overcurrent, fault 12, uh, more so uh, on cable charging, and then also ground faults are more likely on long runs. Uh, interesting statement here, fixed geometry cable uh, offers significant advantages over individual loose conductors. Uh, including reduced cross-coupling of noise and insulation. Uh, they're going to give you some examples here of wire to use at different impacities. Uh, the main reason for this slide is right here. These bullet points, verify motor cable is shielded tight. Uh, when I originally wrote this up, THHN was acceptable. I got it crossed off now using XHHW and cross-link polyethylene. Uh, the nice thing about crosslink polyethylene, it has a self-healing type of reaction um, to heat and arcing on that. A uh, motor cable shield must be connected to both the drive end and the motor end. Verify mechanical brake cable it is terminated to the enclosure ground, not to the drive. Cable charging current solutions, uh, and uh, this will summate the, the previous three slides. At every switch of the IGBT, the capacitance of the cable must be charged. For smaller motors, the cable charging current can exceed the motor drive current rating. Uh, for instance, I found uh, that a five milliamp per linear foot charging current on a 300 foot run, that makes it 1.5 amps charging currents just to heat up the wire which is equivalent to a one horsepower motor. Mitigation of these techniques, use a larger drive. For a very small fee, you can go from a half horsepower drive to a one horsepower drive. It will drive through the charging currents. It has a higher tolerance on that. Common mode chokes, we've talked to them. And you can see, here's the part number. This is a nine amp choke. And, um, 120 degrees out of phase. Uh, you can build these your own uh, and uh, uh, with uh, instructions on the uh, uh, this this uh, literature right here. Um, output reactor uh, will mitigate that. That adds impedance to the line, gives you some sponginess to the drive. I'll limit the motor lead length per my previous statements. Lower the VFD modulation frequencies. It cuts your happenings in half of the problem. And here's the reason here, the, a 525, the definition of overcurrent is 300% of the drive's current. Um, uh, for instance, if you had 2.3 amp drive, it's 6.9 amps. However, on a 753, hardware overcurrent is set at 230% uh, of, the over, of the current of the drive, which would mean it would be, for the same size drive, it would only be 4.83. And I've seen this out in the field. And the reason for this lower setting is you have better regulation in this drive. Some of the regulation on the, the 525 is that you got um, higher current ranges uh, on that particular setting. 
Worst case scenario is when multiple motor leads with high capacitance are ganged together. So if you had uh, 50 foot, you had five motors, 50 foot, uh, it's essentially the same as having one motor 250 foot from your drive. Here's a waveform. Uh, this is the PWM, at, but this is what we're looking for here. This is the common mode voltage. And right here is our problem. It's where we have the fast rise time. And it's more vertical these days than it used to be. We used to have milliseconds. Now we have nanoseconds in the speed of the switching. So our problems are worse than they were yesterday. And the chances are our problems will be worse than they are today, tomorrow, with higher switching speeds. Uh, I drew this one up trying to get an understanding of uh, common mode voltage. And what you do is you take imaginary resistors, tie them to each phase, and then tie them together here and reference to ground. And this is your common mode voltage. Here you see a sine wave, all three phases balanced 120 degrees out, and we have zero voltage here. Now, if you have a difference in voltage on any one of these phases, the difference here will be interpreted as some noise to ground. However, this is three-phase sinusoidal. Take a look at a drive over here. We have very abrupt switching. They aren't always in line like this. So you're always going to get common mode noise out of a VFD. The DVD key, uh, the volts per second increase and decrease. And that's just the switching or the angle of this perpendicular move or close to common mode voltage on all three phases. Uh, okay, that just uh, tells you what I tried to do here with these resistors, the definition of. Uh, I got this out of Alan Bradley. In this picture, all I want to show you is we're going to have coupling of noise on all phases. Uh, we have the potential. And ideally, they would like you to put drive wire to the input of the drive and the output of the drive to isolate this from the ground plane. Now, I drew one up here. And take a look here. This is a drive. And this is drive wire going out to the drive. Now, you take a look here. This is just the shield here. And capacitively coupling the, the shield and the PE back to the drive, we're going to get some coupling. And that's capacitance here. Now, we're going to drive the energy out to the motor. Take a look here. We have another path. The other path continues uh, capacitively. Now we're going to get out to the stator with our energy. But still, we're going to couple from the um, stator to the ground. And it's going to go back this route uh, to the motor. And hopefully, we're going to capture as much as we can from that motor here, and nothing gets into the ground plane. However, if we take a look here, and here it goes. And I missed it. There we go. There it is. In the red line, now it's going to go from the stator, and most of it's going to go back here, hopefully. But if it they're going to have some that's going to go into the ground plane. Uh, and it is going to go down. And remember the jumper we put in? That's going to collect it back here at the drive, and we're going to filter it here. But it's going to make its way back to the drive. And then again, there's another path. And you see the purple going here. The little bubble is going to go clear to the ground plane. It's going to get into the, the, ground, the power grid. It's going to go clear back to the transformer and back to the drive. So that's what this whole thing is about. We have all these paths for uh, capacitively coupled noise getting out into the ground plane and coming back to the drive. Reducing common mode noise. Um, this is the common mode choke that we're going to use here. And uh, again, uh, this uh, is going to be used. Here's the publication, uh, and that's the uh, 
Uh, oh, that's a different publication. This is how to wire them and wind them. But uh, this used to be a practice or is a practice of uh, in the MCCs that are built that whenever there's communications, there's a common mode choke that is put on the output of the drive. And that will go right here on the output of the drive. Uh, they came up with some rule of thumb or some theory, but what it amounts to is if you have anything up to 75 feet uh, input and output of the drive, the wiring's that long, put common mode choke on it. Here's the common mode choke waveform. Uh, as you see here, uh, this is the common mode currents that we have here with this rise time being very short. If we put the choke in, it rounds this off. This lessens the capacitance or the coupling of this noise to the ground plane, to uh, the power grid, et cetera, that we had talked about previously. Okay, the uh, methods for preventing common mode current. Uh, you shielded motor cable. This was brought up time and time again. The best thing to use. This will provide the lowest impedance. The the shielding, the fine wire, will will absorb, will uh, conduct more noise than the the bare wire. Now this is variable over a distance. The longer the distance, the more true this is the lower the impedance. Another option is to utilize insulated bearings, okay. Uh, and these are usually on the fan end. And when you get a higher horsepower motor, they will be standard or porcelain bearings. That breaks the current path. Uh, you can put them in as an option uh, on motors. Um, as an uh, addendum to the motor part number. Grounding brushes and grounding rings. This is a grounding brush. They're the least expensive. You'll see that on uh, some motors uh, from the factory uh, and they just rub on the motor and they ground the shaft out. The other thing is a shaft grounding ring, which is this ring of fine fibers of, uh, 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 it's a circular brush. And technically, I don't believe it actually touches the shaft. If it does, it's gonna wear down. We're going to actually absorb the energy. We're gonna couple it back to ground, off the shaft, at the motor, instead of going through the bearings. And then finally, here's the filters that we can put in. And you see this is an inductor with resistors uh, on that. And uh, as a note down here, ensure panel, uses appropriate grounding bonding scheme, as previously noted, and or galvanized back panel. We encourage that highly here. Uh, and then also bond the uh, bonding straps to bond the, the back plates together. Okay, we're getting near the end here. And um, here's some notes as far as the uh, best practices will go on this. And we'll take a look here. Uh, 301, the access level on drives, make yourself an expert. That way you get to see all the parameters. If you don't, you can't see all the parameters in the 750 drive. Um, 306, the duty rating. The duty rating, um, you set it to heavy duty, actually derates the drive. Your, your 96 amps drive, becomes really a 77 amp drive with higher uh, overload capabilities on that per these uh, ratings here. Um, here also, if you've got uh, fans, high inertia loads, put in flying start. Uh, turn on flying start and that's parameter 356. Uh, 409 DC uh, inhibit, uh, turn that off. Uh, it gives, uh, it will, um, give you a longer, well, the bus voltage can fluctuate a little bit more, and that's a fault 24. Uh, the old Polyflex 70s, I think, 700s, 70s, actually came with that turned off. And then 621, uh, slip, uh, if you have high inertia loads, turn that off. And that's per this uh, knowledge base note here. Uh, 
And before you do that, PowerFlex or uh, Parameter 70 has to be turned off. So that was just some of the things I do on high inertia loads as far as best practices. If you bring up the software CCW and you look at the drive, it will say that it's a 77 amp drive here. But if you go into properties, it'll say that it's really to give you the part number, uh, a 96 amp drive. And then you'll know that uh, that is uh, that it's a heavy duty drive rather than a normal duty. And that has to be set from properties, can't be set from parameters. Best practices here. Um, uh, I, I sat down and talked with the, uh, the uh, field engineers from Rockwell. And uh, I witnessed this, uh, this particular engineer, uh, initials TE, he used ohms and he would ohm out a motor before he started it, phase to phase, uh, phase to ground. Uh, and uh, he verified that, and also bust to ground, uh, bust to phase, bust to ground, yes, with different, and he'd verify that he wasn't shorted. Uh, I saw him catch one once on a 300 horsepower motor where they had driven the cover motor on uh, with force and had wore through the tape that they had walked, that they had wrapped the uh, mechanical bolts with and it was grounded and they took the cover off and the ground went away. He found that before starting it up. Uh, another engineer uh, likes to use the, uh, the diode test and that's to see if the output transistors uh, are good and he did a bus to phase, uh, forward and reverse, that is stated in this publication here, publication 750-TG, and again, that's for technical guide 001. Uh, use that if you have a, uh, you want to test the output transistors. And uh, again, he used uh, different, uh, different uh, um, schemes to look at that, follow what that guideline says. Here's your process screen on the HIM. HIM can be set up as status or process screen, and you can get the uh, process screen just by hitting the escape key uh, in the upper left or right here. You have six parameters to program here, and you, uh, you can program in anything you want. And I recommend this, that you put a value in there that is um, valuable to the process. So if you're away and there is need to look at parameters, they just hit the escape key, and then they can thumb through these six parameters rather than learn how to go from file to file or a long linear list. And uh, here's the defaults up here. I suggested possibly speed reference uh, source. You can see where the speed is coming from in auto off manual. Last fault, uh, the, the action that you usually see in the field is hit the red button and keep running. And I don't remember what the fault was. Well, you could put the last fault up here, just hit the escape key, and it would be right there to read uh, for uh, a very simple way to look at it. And, and the uh, commanded speed reference is coming from uh, right here. And motor overload counter. I like that one. It tells how heavily the motor's looking. They can look at counts. As soon as it gets up to 100, you're going to get your motor overload fault. What else to watch for? Uh, on this, if you have motors that are stored, uh, I have a customer here in town that has over 80 motors stored in Northwest Ohio. And it says right here, uh, in long-term storage, the drive unit must be connected uh, to the DC voltage for at least five minutes every two years. Otherwise, units severe service life will be reduced. Uh, knowledge base note 18015 will give you uh, the technical information on that. One of our vendors actually sells a device that you can rejuvenate those capacitors. Um, I just had this week, a customer said, um, I'm going to use one out of my shelf. I said, send me the name tag, and it was three years old. And so we're going to go out, and we're going to look at the capacitors, and we're going to power up the drive and make sure that the uh, they are rejuvenated. And what happens is the oil settles in the capacitors. So if you do put a trickle charge on them, um, that the oil will flow and fill the capacitor up. If not, you're liable to have an explosion when you power it up. And what can you do? We're getting to the end here. Again, here's the uh, documents that have backed up uh, most of the uh, statements. 
on this slide set. I'd encourage you to put these in your library. These are recommendations up here for drives. Uh, anytime you see a part number uh, reference here, uh, these are specs for particular drives in these uh, booklets. Okay, you are a world class as long as your installation is world class. And that's our hopes. And uh, thank you for tuning in and looking at this. And we have a little quiz here for us and we'll go through this and I'll self answer, but um, you can download this from the website and uh, fill it out on your own. And here we go. Question number one, verify the paint is scraped away down to the bare metal when mounting the blank. And if we take a look down here at the answers, we would put the ground bar. Make sure that ground bar has the paint scraped away underneath it. If you have a galvanized back plate, you don't have to look. You don't have to stick your head in the 480 volt area and look to see that the ground, the paint was scraped away. Verify the ground wire is run from the drive blank terminal directly to the enclosure ground bar using a specified gauge wire. And that would be the PE ground. And um, that would probably be the left PE ground on that. Um, verify question three. Verify a ground wire is run from the motor blank to the ground, from the motor directly to the ground. Remember, we had the picture of the uh, disconnect out there in the field. Don't let that uh, ground wire touch the PE or the yellow and green terminal block in there. Number four, verify multiple sub panels are bonded together with blank, and that would be braided metal straps. Braid attracts the noise more than solid. Unbalanced, ungrounded, or resistive grounded distribution systems blank the protective MOVs and the common mode capacitors, and that is remove. The statement we used was all in or all out. Motor overload current is to motor overload faults as motor nameplate full load amps is to tuning. Uh, the only reason you have motor uh, nameplate current is for tuning or uh, setup of the drive interpretation of the motor protection. Um, verify isolation transformers, blank supply voltages, source wiring design, and that would be secondary supply voltage source wiring design. Verify grounded Y or not. DBRT, DBRT, that was our French word for last week. And here, eight ohms is equal to how many horsepower torque braking? And the rule of thumb was 100 horsepower. So if you had a five horse or a 50 horsepower motor, you're most likely to have an eight ohm resistor because it gives you 200% torque. Verify the isolation transformer is what type? And that is Rock Automation 1321, or a good quality type is what we're trying to say. Verify the isolation transformer KVA size does not exceed blank the KVA rating of the drive, and that'll be two different ratings, 10 slash 20 times, depending if you have an inductor between the converter and the inverter, most likely on the 750 drives, less likely on the 520. Number nine, verify XO on the secondary of the isolation transformer is solidly grounded or less than one ohm. Number 10, this may be required if the isolation transformer is not used. No device shall be wired between it and the secondary, and that would be a reactor line reactor that is. Verify motor cable is, and that would be shielded. Highly recommended to have shielded cable between the motor and the drive. Verify motor cable shield must be connected at both ends. Uh, we've said that several times, connected at both ends with no uh, paths to ground between there. 
verify the mechanical brake cable shield is terminated to the enclosure ground, not the PE ground of the drive. Verify the type of encoder cable being used, which is low capacitance cable. Read your um, user manual specs on the uh, encoder to define that. Verify encoder cable wiring is not within this distance of the motor, 12 inches of the motor power wiring, that is, for the motor brake wiring within the enclosure. Verify encoder cable wiring outside of the enclosure is run in raceways using dividers or with separate conduit runs. Verify a dynamic brake is installed and wired to BR1 and BR2 terminals, a simple check. Verify the dynamic brake cable is twisted pair. If you're just using plain wire, put the twist in it yourself. Verify there is separation between high and low voltage wiring and the wires across at right angles or 90 degrees. And question 20, the last, verify blank are installed on all coils. And that's for contactor solenoids, relays, brake coils to reduce transients that can interfere with the drives, and that would be surge suppressors. There you go. Um, I hope you uh, got these answered and give us a call or uh, uh, te uh, text us, email us if you need anything else on this. Okay, Rachel? Great, thank you, Wes. Um, we had a couple questions in the comment section regarding some of the information on one of your slides, 35 and 36, but Lee was able to get us some links to that information. And we did put those links in the comment section. So if you have any questions regarding slides 35 and 36, take a look at those links. Um, I'd like to remind you, you can always reach out to us at our Mac and Mac Live email address if you have questions for less, even after this live stream is ended, if you're watching it as a recording. That email address is mcmclive at mc-mc.com. And wonderful. Thank you for viewing everyone today. Thank you, Les, for your presentation and Lee for being our resource out in the comments section. We hope this session and the one before it were informative and engaging for you. Remember to subscribe to our McNaughton McKay YouTube channel for more industry content like this. And we will see you live again next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Les. All right, are you there? I'm here.